in this video, we're going to uh, review some of the material that was covered in the first power transmissions video, uh, look at a couple of examples, and then um, also review the, uh, the power transmissions assessment from the first video. So this is just an interesting transmission right here. This is from an Allison uh, 5,000 horsepower gas turbine used on the um, uh, Hercules C-130. Uh, so we have a, a turboprop. Uh, the output on this is 19,600 foot-pounds of torque. Pretty amazing. The, with the, the propeller speed was limited to 1,000 RPM to avoid supersonic uh, tip speed. And the gas turbine itself uh, turbs, turns at 14,000 RPM. So this, the ratio here is 13.27 uh, to 1. You can see that it, it uses a, um, a planetary reduction inside here. You can see the planetary gears. And here's another picture of it. And here's the plane. And this, of course, is uh, Ken Stafford, who you've seen on some of the earlier videos. This was from uh, in Panama in 1975. He's still as fit and energetic as ever, of course. And just to review a little bit from the uh, motor videos, right, these are typical motor curves. Uh, normally, power, current, efficiency are plotted either versus torque or speed. Um, and of course, if, if the horizontal axis is speed, then torque is going to be on the vertical axis. The, the speed versus torque is uh, you can see is just a linear relationship with here's your no load speed so for this motor it's about 2500 rpm and um, and when the the the, uh, the motor stalls the torque the stall torque is down over here so you've probably experienced this if you've used a cordless drill to drive deck screws you know as the as the deck screws if you have some long deck screws as they go deeper there's more friction and eventually you may, if the drill stops, the motor stops, then you've stalled it, so you're down over here. But it, for permanent magnet DC motor, this relationship is linear, which makes it very easy to generate these other curves. The power curve is a parabola. Uh, because the power um, output on a rotating shaft is equal to the torque times the angular speed, right? So you can see over here you have high speed but no torque, so the power output is zero. Over here, you have high torque but no speed, so the power output zero. And um, if you do the, the calculus on this, you can show that the maximum power occurs at one half the stall torque and one half the no load speed. Um, so if you had a power requirement, for instance, uh, at full voltage here, at 12, this, in this case 12 volts, and you had a power requir requirement, if you wanted this to, to be running over here at 120 watts, there would also be uh, another point over here at 120 watts. So in one case, over here, you have very low torque, high speed. Over here, you have high torque and low speed. Almost always, you want to run on this side of the power curve, right? In other words, low torque, high speed. But one thing you can see that the efficiency is much higher, right? At uh, this point right here, you have a very high efficiency. It looks like about 75%. And on the other hand, if you go over to this side, uh, the efficiency pretty low, right? Almost down to 10%, which means you're to do the same amount of output power, you're putting a lot more electrical power into the motor, and that's just being turned into heat, right? That the power that isn't coming out the shaft is just being turned into heat, which is really bad, right? First of all, you're wasting that power, but you're also heating up the motor. Um, if the motor coils get hot, as, as you know, um, metals, if the temperature goes up, the resistance goes up. So you end up uh, ha even get having less current going through the motor, generating, you're generating a lot of excess heat, and you the power drops off even more. Um, so another reason to be over on this side is that uh, so, something like a cordless drill, it has cooling fans on the motor, when you're running at high speed, you get a lot more cooling air. It's kind of like a double whammy. You you have, if you're over on this side, the motor's not spinning as fast. You have less cooling air, 
and you have a lot more heat to get rid of. Um, another reason to, to be over on this side, whether you're trying to control the motor autonomously or manually, suppose you're over on this side of the curve and you suddenly lose the load. Well, you're already running at a pretty high speed, so the speed isn't going to change that much. It's going to be easier to get it back under control. On the other hand, if you're way over here and you lose the load, then suddenly your speed is going to drop, is going to go from uh, a low speed way up to a high speed. It's going to be harder to get it back under control. So anyways, those are, uh, this is just kind of a little quick review on some of these curves. Um, so uh, from the first video um, we talked about, or um, the, the, the video discussed speed ratio, and um, so here's the equation right here, the speed ratio, it's product of the number of drivers divided by the number of driven. These are, these are teeth, either on a sprocket or on a gear. Um, the, the lowercase n is the, uh, the, 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 the um, angular speed of the input and the output of the transmission. So uh, sometimes you might see the Greek letter omega used for angular speed. In this case, it's just the, the lowercase n. Um, so notice that um, that this is directly that this speed ratio is independent of friction. So, for instance, suppose you just have a single stage and you have um, ten teeth on the the uh, or ten teeth on the driver, and then the driven gear or sprocket has fifty. So that would be a speed ratio of one fifth or 0.2. And that means, of course, that the output shaft is going to spin at one-fifth the speed of the input shaft. So if the input shaft is sp spinning at 500 RPM, the output shaft is spinning at 100 RPM. It doesn't matter if there's fr how much friction there is. Um, as long as the gears aren't slipping or the sprocket and the chain isn't slipping on the chain, then this is the same regardless of how much friction you have. On the other hand, the ratio between the torque input and the torque output does depend on how much friction you have, right? So this is just the product of the efficiencies of each stage. So if if you have two stages, then you multiply those two efficiencies together to get the system efficiency. One way, I, sometimes students get mixed up as opposed to whether you try to make a calculation, you do divide by efficiency or multiply by efficiency. Well, an easy way to remember it is if you have a given torque output requirement, um, and you're calculating the torque input requirement, you're always going to divide by the efficiency because the friction is going to, for a given torque output, the input is going to increase as the friction goes up, right? Or as the efficiency goes, as the efficiency goes down. On the other hand, if you if you have a certain motor you're using and um, you know what the torque input into the transmission is, and you're trying to calculate the torque output. Well, the friction is always going to make the torque output less than if there were no friction. So then you multiply, um, you know, and get, as you do your algebra and calculate these things, the torque output is always going to be less than it would be without friction, right? And that's not to say it's still going to be larger, or it's, it, depending on the speed ratio, it still may be larger than the T input, but it will be less than it would have been if there were if there had uh, not been friction. Um, so. Uh, just quickly to review gears, remember that um, uh, if this is the input gear here and you apply a torque to that shaft, the driver then turns that torque into a force on the tooth here. Um, from Newton's third law, law, we know that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? So the force is the same on the other gear, um, but because it's moment arm, or which is uh, this distance over here, is larger, you get the larger torque output. But of course, uh, you know, again, if this were 10 teeth and this were 50 teeth, this gear would have to turn um, 10 times for every one time that this gear turns. So um, you have increased torque but decreased speed, if if that were the case. Um, and the important um, circles or diameters on a gear. Usually when you talk about a gear diameter, you're almost always talking about the pitch diameter. Here's the pitch circle right here. 
Uh, there are actually three other circles. There's the addendum circle, which is a circle that runs through the top land, uh, the dedenum circle, which runs through the bottom land, and then you have a base circle, which may be uh, s smaller in diameter or larger in diameter to the dedenum circle. Um, here's another view of that. And the base circle is a circle that, that is used to create the, the, uh, the gear profile. The in, this is an involute curve. And that's used so that you maintain, you know, as the gears roll on each other, you want to maintain a constant ratio between the speeds, right? So that's why you use an involute curve. So you get what's called conjugate action. This is covered in more detail in a different video. Um, but anyway, so that's just a quick review on that. So again, if we look at some transmissions essentials, um, obviously modified speed versus, versus torque, uh, change direction of rotation or not, uh, and physically separate the motor from the device. And the important thing to remember is that a transmission will always reduce the power because of the, the frictional losses within the transmission. So a transmission can help you provide greater torque if that's what you need, but it won't provide greater power. Okay, and again, um, you can talk about pitch diameters um, and figure out ratios that way, but the easiest way generally to determine the speed ratio is by looking at the number of teeth on the drivers and the number of teeth on the driven. Um, and again, we ju we've just talked about this equation. So, so here's an, an example. If we look at this uh, example right here, here's a roller, it's from a first robot. Uh, so this roller was uh, picking things up, and um, here's the motor in the background here. So right here, the drivers we have on the motor, there's a, there's a gear, right? So the first stage has two gears, and the second stage has two sprockets. So in this case, the driver is a 16-tooth gear, and over on this stage, we have an 18-tooth sprocket. And that 18-tooth gear drives a 54-tooth gear. And the 18 tooth sprocket drives a 28 tooth sprocket. Okay, so we can calculate the speed ratio again is independent of friction. And uh, with a motor spinning at 5,000 RPM, we can calculate the roller speed would be 950 RPM. Okay, so we have losses occurring at both stages. We're going to say that the efficiency of each stage is 0.95. Um, so uh, if we want to calculate the torque output, or I'm sorry, the, the, um, if we want to have a force um, that this roller can apply of 20 pounds, and it's a 2-inch roller, then that means that the moment arm is going to be the radius or 1 inch. So that means that the output, we need 20 inch pounds. Okay, so our torque input then would be work out to be 4.2, right? So we multiplied by the speed ratio. And remember that we have a given torque that we want. The torque input is always going to be larger because of the friction. So we're dividing by the product of these efficiencies, right? If there were no friction here, well, 0.19 times 20 would be 3.8 inch pounds. So we, if there's no friction, um, we'd get the same power out as we put in, and uh, we would end up with 3.8 inch pounds of torque at the out um, required by the motor. But because the of the friction, we need a greater torque input. So that's going to be 4.2. So now if we want to figure out um, uh, what the load would be on the motor, right? we can look at this diagram right here. And um, so this here we have the torque in inch pounds and the current right here. And so we can do a liter, linear interpolation. We want to determine how much current is going to be required. What are the loads going to be at 4.2? So um, the current over here, right, 4.2 is in between 2.9 and 4.3. So we're going to say the current's equal to 20.1 plus, well, what's the fraction of, of, of the way that we've gone from this data point to that data point? If we assume it's, it's changing linearly, then it's going to be this 4.2 minus 2.9 over 4.3 minus 2.9. That's the fraction of the way that we've gone from 20.1 to 28.8. So we multiply that times that difference, 
and add it to 20.1 and get the 28.2 amps. Okay, and then again, just quickly reviewing um, roller chains. Uh, so we can see that the uh, the first number is on a, on a roller chain is the pitch, is the distance from uh, center to center in eighths. So ANSI 25 chain would be two eighths or a quarter of an inch between the two centers. And then the second number signifies whether or not there's a roller or, or just it's just bushed. So um, and then we also you also depending on the material. So this is for a typical steel chain. Um, you can see that it has a breaking strength ANSI 25 of 875, but a working strength of 140. So in other words, if you have a chain and you want it to run without failing for 10 years, think about the, the timing chain in your car, for instance. Um, you're going to design that so not so that it's just slightly underneath the braking strength obviously but you want it to, it's it would be, have to be much much lower than that if that thing is going to be running for fi uh, 15 or 20 years and you don't want it to break of course okay and just <clears throat> in terms of uh, chain design one thing you want to make sure is that uh, you always you need to have generally on the drive sprocket the the power sprocket that's powering the system you want to have at least 120 degrees of wrap around that sprocket and this this material is covered in more detail in another video so one thing that's um, was talked about in the earlier video also was worm gears and worm gears because of all this you can you can imagine all the slotting that's going on here um, as opposed to spur gears, which uh, you know that the the motion is trans is transmitted differently, so th these tend to have a lot more friction, um, but you can get a pretty high ratio. So in this case, I don't know if, how well you can see this, but um, uh, this is a quadruple start. So in other words, um, the pitch on a on a thread like this is the distance from one tooth to the other. So if you had like threaded rod with a single start, when you turn it, rotate it 360 degrees, it moves one pitch. This one has four starts. So if you turn this 360 degrees, it actually moves four, right? That particular thread will move forward four pitches. So if this gear has 50 teeth, for instance, let's see, right? Then in that case, you would have this kind of speed ratio, a pretty high speed ratio for a single stage. If you just had, you know, if this was just a single start thread, then it would be one over 50. Um, so obviously, generally, if you want really high speed uh, or high power, this is not something you're going to use. And you also have to make sure that this is very well supported with bearings because there's a, a very large radial force here. Um, so just some general suggestions. Uh, usually you want to, um, if you're controlling an arm or something like that, you want to control the, st the top speed by the gearing, not by, you know, if it's a 12 volt, if you have 12 volt battery and you say, well, we can just run at two volts or something like that so that the arm doesn't move too fast. Now you probably want to gear it much higher so that, uh, you know, at 12 volts, it's going at the speed that you want. Remember too, that, um, at high speeds, the motor generally runs much more efficiently so and you have the advantage of having a lot more torque if you need it um, so um, and the other the other thing is normally you want to avoid a powered uh, back drive so if you're picking something up and carrying it around you want to have some other mechanism either you know a brake or some kind of locking mechanism instead of just trying to keep providing just the right amount of power to the motor so it doesn't back drive um, actually, I'm going to go back to uh, the motor curve. Sorry about that. That was an important point I, I forgot to mention. Whoop, back here. So we talked about at 120 watts of power, we could be either at this point or at this point, right? So here's a huge advantage to designing to this point instead of this point. 
suppose for some reason you need a lot more torque, right? Well, if you're over here, you're going to be at this point on the speed versus torque curve. And if you suddenly need more torque, right, look at all the extra torque you have. All this extra torque is available if you need it. Not only that, uh, power, which is going to, is, is energy per unit time. So if you're down here and you need more torque, you're going to move up the power curve. You're actually going to get more power. On the other hand, if you had designed over to here and suddenly you need more torque, you don't have very much torque left to go. And if you do require more torque, the power is dropping off very quickly. So it's going to take you a lot, to lot longer to do the task, whatever that might be. So, Okay, so uh, picking up where we left off here, um, let's review the the questions from the quiz now, right? So first of all, the first question was the speed ratio of a transmission, and here are the three choices. Uh, the correct answer is an exact number defined by the component tooth counts. Um, it's not interchangeably called the torque ratio. Sometimes you talk about a gear ratio, which is the inverse of the speed ratio, but it's not it, even that is not equal to the inverse of the torque ratio because of, of friction. Um, so a common uh, answer might be to, or mist mistaken answer, incorrect answer, is various with the efficiency of the, of the gear train. Um, and again, that's described here. It only depends on the number of teeth and um, doesn't, de doesn't depend in, on how much friction is, as we've discussed before. Worm gear transmissions. They're int int intrinsically high efficiency. Obviously, that's that's an incorrect answer. And they're compact coaxial design. You know, from this picture, of course, you can see they don't have a coaxial design. So the correct answer is resistant to being back driven. Now, uh, one thing to remember, though, that that it is possible to back drive worm gears, especially if they have a high angle in this uh, helix here. So this one has a very low angle. This one obviously would be pretty hard to back drive to turn this big gear and make this one turn. But uh, other types, they can be back driven. Okay, and then the power transmission, uh, this next question, multi-stage transmissions are characterized by, right, correct answer, system efficiency is that a product of each stage efficiency. Um, overall speed ratio is that sum. Now it would be uh, the overall speed ratio is a product of individual stage ratios, not the sum of individual stage ratios. And then always reversing the input direction of the output shaft. Uh, if you have an odd number like one or three, um, then the input direction will be reverse. But with an even number of stages, like two, you will have the same direction as the input. And remember that you can always use an idle or sprocket um, to reverse the direction as well. And um, so let's move on. So uh, what happens when an idle gear is added to a transmission? Output direction is reversed. Here's a, uh, um, a common incorrect answer. Torque output is unchanged, right? Even though the speed ratio doesn't change, you've added an additional axle, right? You have... Um, teeth that are ex more teeth now that are rubbing on each other, right? You have teeth on both sides, a gear connected or, or meshing with the idle gear on both sides. So you're adding friction to the system. So even though the speed ratio doesn't change, um, the torque output will be changed. And then speed ratio is affected by the tooth count of the idler. That, that's incorrect also. And then this answer, um, obviously, is the three is stands for the distance between the rollers and one eighth of an inch. So what it, what we would like you to do at this point is to try this problem. So this is um, um, you can there's a PDF of this on the LMS uh, in Canvas. And so we have this case where we have a two stage system. We have gears here and a chain and sprockets right here on this. Uh, in this case, we have two motors, right, driving this. Uh, this is a 56-tooth gear. These are both 16-tooth gears, right? So the that uh, the in terms of the output torque here, 
the input torque required on this initial stage, we're going to get twice whatever the motor torque is as the input torque here because there's two motors. It's important to point out that if we say the efficiency is uh, 0.95 per stage, the fact that you have two motors on this stage, you don't multiply 0.95 times 0.95 for this first stage because the efficiency you know, of what's happening over here is independent of what's happening over here. They're both 0.95%, so the, the efficiency of the overall stage, even though you have two motors, is still 0.95. And then the second stage is, is another 0.95. So um, the requirement here is that um, you would have, let's see, right, so on the wheel right here, we would have a tractive force of, let's see if I can draw this, right, of 30 pounds. 30 pounds. So then you can figure out, you know, the diameter is five inches. You can figure out how much output torque you need from this transmission, work your way back, uh, and then figure out um, if you um, do not want to exceed 29 amps per motor, that's 29 amps per motor, not for the to both of the motors together. Um, you can then figure out what kind of sprocket, how many teeth do you want to have on this sprocket right here so that you don't exceed 29 amps. Um, okay, so obviously if you add more teeth to the sprocket, right, you'll, you'll, for these, you know, for 29 amps for a given amount of input torque, you would get more output torque, but it would move more slowly. So this is a design condition, and uh, uh, so you can work that problem and um, see how you do. So thank you for watching this video and uh, uh, try to do that problem. And uh, there's actually a survey which uh, you can put your answer in. Doesn't affect negatively impact your grade uh, if you're a student, uh, but um, that gives the instructor a chance to see how you did on this problem.